Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa and Linda, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. I'm Tim Kennelty. And I'm Jean Thomas. Today we're talking to one of our Master Gardener volunteers and our podcast co-founder, Teresa Golden. She's the brains behind all of this. And our topic is about coexisting with deer. Welcome, Teresa. Thanks for having me. So let's start with you telling us a little bit about yourself and how you became so interested in learning how to live with deer. Well, my grandparents had a farm in Greene County that they bought almost 100 years ago. So I've been visiting this area my entire life. Once my husband and I retired, we decided to renovate their house and move here permanently. It's a large parcel, over 100 acres, and is mostly forested with both deciduous and evergreen trees, along with several fields where cows and sheep used to graze. Thus, it's an ideal environment for deer. In fact, deer are everywhere. But being a lifelong gardener, I started both flower and vegetable gardens on the property and quickly learned that to be successful, I had to learn how to coexist with deer. Yeah, you have a beautiful property, Teresa. I've been there, and I can understand why you'd have to deal with deer because there's so much out there. You know, deer play a vital role in the natural and cultural environment of New York State, and they're valued for their beauty and grace, as well as utilitarian benefits that they provide. But they also present problems, right? So why do so many people have love-hate relationships with deer? I know I do. Well, unfortunately, the annual estimates of deer damage exceed almost $2 billion. So they can be a big problem. And they impact people, crops, forests, and, of course, our gardens. In New York State alone, an estimated 50,000 deer vehicle collisions occur every year, resulting in about 29,000 injuries and approximately 200 deaths. Most collisions occur in early morning or at dusk, especially between October and December, so be especially careful at that time of year. Deer are also carriers of ticks that transmit Lyme disease that results in over 25,000 human cases each year. And and high-density deer browsing also reduces the diversity of the forest understory, enabling invasive species to outcompete natives and prevent seedlings for many species from growing into the next generation of trees. It's been estimated that approximately 20 deer living in a square mile can destroy a forest. And while deer live on the edges of forests, they've adapted quite well to the suburban landscape and enjoy going after tasty treats in our gardens. Well, that's pretty daunting. What can we do to regain control of our gardens when coexisting with deer? Well, there's a few things to consider. Diet, and I mean theirs, not ours. Access to gardens and yards, and various barriers we can construct. While we're talking specifically about deer right now, the same approaches will be successful with a little modification with other critters out there that are interested in the result of all our hard work. The fundamental question you should ask yourself is how much time and or money are you willing to invest to prevent damage to your garden? There's lots of options, but they range from a live and let live approach to being very selective in your garden plantings, which will limit your plant choices, to fencing, which can be expensive, and repellents or scare tactics, which are time intensive. So you need to choose. Okay, so let's start with diet. What I guess I should ask, what don't they eat, but what do they eat? Unfortunately, if they're hungry enough, deer will eat just about any plant. They eat grasses, clover, acorns, fruit, corn, twigs, leaves, and buds with a preference for tender or new growth. So almost anything is a potential target. They have a four-chambered stomach with digestive microbes that change with the season allowing them to adapt to a wide range of habitats and availability of food sources. This also enables them to digest a variety of foods. 
For example, from January to March, they survive by browsing on conifers, deciduous bark, dry leaves, acorns, and other nuts, winter fruits such as rose hips, sumac, and poison ivy, about four to five pounds a day. But between April and June, you'll find them eating herbaceous plants and grasses, as well as buds and shoots of shrubs and trees up to seven to 10 pounds a day. In July and August, they shift to herbaceous vegetation, which includes young leaves and new growth of shrubs and trees, which often includes our gardens. Completing the cycle from September to December, they'll shift to soft fruits and hard nuts. Acorns make about 50% of their diet that time of year, but they've also been known to eat bramble leaves, mushrooms, and yes, gardens. A deer typically consumes 3% of its body weight each day, which is approximately four to 6,000 calories or four to 10 pounds of food. As this amount of food is typically not available in the small woodlots of suburbia, that's why lawns and hedges and flower beds are all attractive to deer. Okay, how do I know if it's deer that are attacking my gardens as opposed to other forms of wildlife? Well, this can be a bit tricky. I once thought the deer were eating some of my plants, but figured out it was actually rabbits. The key here is to look at the plant damage. Note that the deer have incisors or teeth only at the bottom of their mouths, so they pinch or pull rather than cut their forage. Their bottom incisors impact the upper pad of their mouths which consists of cartilage. As a result, they have to tear or jerk plants, often uprooting them. This leaves ragged, broken ends on the plants from the ground level up to about six feet high. By contrast, rabbits and other rodents typically leave a clean cut surface or simply clip a stem. But remember, wildlife browsing varies with changes in wildlife populations, availability of alternative foods, and environmental conditions. So damage from deer browsing is most severe when snow cover or extreme cold reduces availability of other foods. But summer droughts can cause similar problems. When wildlife gets hungry enough, they will eat anything. Or as some folks say, deer will eat anything if it's expensive enough. So how do I make my garden less appealing to deer then, Teresa? Careful plant selection is the answer. As a rule of thumb, deer tend to avoid certain types of plants, including toxic ones like daffodils, fuzzy leaves like lamb's ear and lavender, aromatic herbs, think parsley, fennel, mints, and sages, strong-tasting plants like alliums or garlic, or prickly leaves. Think of spruce trees as an example. There's a cooperative extension page that includes a list of deer-resistant plants that might be of interest. We'll include a link on our podcast webpage. That said, bear in mind that deer can't read these lists. So experiment to see what works in your own yard. As I've said before, if deer are hungry enough, they will eat anything. I have personally have had success with daffodils, peonies, irises, coneflowers, bee balm, foxglove, black-eyed Susan, lantana, nasturtiums, Russian sage, and more. So you can still have a colorful garden and coexist with deer if you are selective with what you plant. From a tree and shrub perspective, consider investing in andromeda, boxwoods, which seem to be indestructible around deer, butterfly bush, viburnum, juniper, birch trees, there's a lot of varieties in this category, cedar trees, flowering dogwood, but make sure to protect the bark when it's young, service berries, spruce trees, they don't like these needles, and the tulip poplar tree. So again, there's lots of options. Okay, so it sounds like there's specific plants I should avoid in my landscape, the ones you call deer candy, if I have a lot of deer pressure in my area. Sure, there's definitely a category of plants that are called deer candy because it seems that deer simply can't resist them. Tulips come to mind. That said, you can have some tulips if you plant them among the daffodils that the deer have learned to stay away from. Hostas are also considered deer candy. However, you can have them if you have a more enclosed garden space, as deer tend to avoid closed spaces where they don't feel comfortable having an easy means of egress. Other plants and shrubs known as deer candy include daylilies, English ivy and pachysandra, apple trees, including crab apples, cherry trees, azaleas, blueberries and blackberries, locust trees, in which especially their seed pods, yews, and let's not forget about arborvitae. 
They love those leaves and have been known to turn them into lollipops. If you really like arborvitae, invest in a fence or repellent program. Thank goodness I don't really like arborvitae. How about deer repellents? I know there's lots of different repellents out there. Do they really work? You have to think of repellents as behavior modifiers. Their performance is variable depending upon deer density. They will perform well under moderate deer pressure, but may be completely ignored when alternate food sources are scarce. And repellents weather rapidly and require frequent application. New growth especially requires protection. Deer love the tender new leaves and shoots of ground covers when they first emerge in the spring. To eliminate the temptation, treat the area with a strong-smelling deer repellent or something that also doubles as a chemical-free fertilizer, such as blood meal or fish emulsion. Realize that many spray repellents can only be applied effectively during mild weather. Potential repellent issues include labeling restrictions, so make sure the repellent you're considering using is approved for New York State. Other issues include equipment problems, as the slurries from heavy binding agents can clog application equipment, and residues on your plants, which can be noxious or anesthetic. Deer are also frightened away by loud noises and sudden movement. You can keep them on edge by hanging wind chimes from the branches of trees or shrubs or by placing wind spinners throughout your garden. If you have an active dog, they can often be helpful in keeping deer away, but note that deer tend to be more active at night when your pet may be indoors. You can try startling them with a sudden spray of water by installing a motion-activated sprinkler, but the problem with repellents is that deer can get used to them in the landscape, which diminishes their effectiveness. The net is repellents can work, at least in the short term, but they tend to be time-intensive. So keep that in mind if you're planning to use repellents and consider mixing them up to keep the deer on their toes and away from your plants. I like that visual deers wandering around on the tiptoe. What about fencing? What options should I consider? Fencing is a great option. Its primary downside is that it's more expensive than the other choices, but it definitely works. Think of it as a one-and-done approach. Fencing options include woven wire, polypropylene mesh, or electric fencing. If you opt for woven wire or polypropylene mesh, make sure that the fence is six to seven feet high to be effective. High tensile electric fences have a high initial installation cost and require regular maintenance due to either heavy snow or dry soil conditions. Polytape electric fences are temporary and work best under light deer pressure during the summer and fall. Peanut butter on the fence entices deer to sniff the fence where they are then shocked and thus hopefully they learn to avoid these fenced areas. Note that it's especially important to protect trees, especially below their browse line, which is about five feet above ground level. Bucks remove their dead velvet and polish the new antlers in October and November by using trunks of young trees or the branches of shrubs. If the buck rubs through the bark all around a trunk, the tree may die. Unfortunately, I lost a willow tree due to a buck rub, so be warned. Protect those young trees. So it's nice to hear that at least we have some options to coexist with deer. We definitely do. In summary, to garden successfully with deer, consider installing a fence, planting deer-resistant varieties, using spray repellents, but do this persistently, or using a dog to chase deer out of the yard. You can always plant enough so you don't mind sharing some. I suggest you read and compare notes with other gardeners to learn what works for them. Just make sure to protect shrubs and young trees up to the browse line, and remember, deer don't read, don't eat lists, and in tougher times, we'll eat just about anything. Well, that was encouraging. Thank you for joining us today, Teresa. I hope our listeners have learned something new from you. Thanks for having me. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from a Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Linnell and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. 
comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at Columbia Green MGB at Cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 